that it is God himself who makes us sure of our life and union with Christ. It is God himself who has set us apart, who has placed his mark of ownership upon us, and who has given us the Holy Spirit in our hearts as the guarantee of all that he has in store for us. Believing in that promise, we come to God with our congregational response and please join in with the words in bold. The world belongs to God. Yes. <laughs> the people are His. How good and lovely it is to live together, together in unity. Love and faith come together. Justice and peace join hands. If the Lord's disciples keep silent, these stones which I call Lord, open our lips. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. We stand to sing hymn 201 in the books, Worship the Lord in the Beauty of Holiness, and of course it's on the screen.
Almighty God, our Creator and Redeemer, we come into your presence to worship you with hearts that love you, with lips that honor you, and lives that seek to serve you. Father, you know every thought that we have and every action that we take, those that are worthy of us and those that are not. And Father, we are so sorry for the pain we cause you in so many different ways. We remember the wrongs we have done, the good that we have failed to do, and we ask your forgiveness. Will you take each one of us and in your mercy and love, will you cleanse and pardon us? Will you refresh and renew us in the power of the Holy Spirit? And in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Amen. Angus and Andrea are going to sing the song of praise, I Need a Ghost. the smoke or mirrors cause I know there's a God who's real I don't need the lights to fool me cause I've seen a God who heals I know when I ask I'll receive it cause you're not a God who withholds I hear you say just believe me I need a Holy Ghost awakening my soul I need a love that goes rattle in my bones till the evidence shows. I need a Holy Ghost awakening in my soul. I need a heart on fire and I'll never grow tired wherever I go. I need a Holy, Holy Ghost. I need a ghost. Counterfeit comfort Cause there's nothing this world remains I need something stronger than lightning Flowing inside these veins And when I ask I receive it Cause you're not a God who withholds I hear you say just believe me I need a Holy Ghost Awakening in my soul I need a love that goes rattle in my bones to the evidence shows. I need a Holy Ghost awakening in my soul. I need a heart on fire that'll never grow tired wherever I go. I need a Holy, Holy Ghost. I need a ghost. Explained it. It's like I'm bursting with a heavenly language And every time I get a taste I just want more, I just want more You're the kingdom that's been growing inside me It's like the lion's where you want to revive me And every time I get a taste I just want more I need a Holy Ghost Awakening in my soul I need a love that grows rattle in my bones till the evidence shows. I need a Holy Ghost awakening in my soul. I need a heart on fire that'll never grow tired wherever I go. I need a Holy, Holy Ghost. I need a ghost. And then Mark 10, verses 35 to 45. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. 
but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, <clears throat> yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offering, his offspring, and prolong his days and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of light and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great and he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of men and made intercession for the transgressors. And from Mark 10, verse 35 to 45. Then James and John the sons of Zebedee came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink, or be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will drink the cup I drink, and be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Amen. Thank you, Mayor. When I was about 14, my cousin and I decided we would ask our parents to let us smoke. Remember, it was cool in those days. Now, we'd been smoking on the slide for about two years or so. We decided it was time to get official permission. There were two reasons for this. First, 
we thought it would make us more important when everyone saw how grown up we were. And secondly, instead of taking the odd cigarette from my dad's packet when I got the chance, I thought I could just ask him for them instead. No problem, I thought, as I plucked up the nerve to ask, how could he refuse? Well, I was wrong on all kinds, as you'll have guessed. I asked my dad, who normally gave me everything and anything I asked for, no matter what it was, without even waiting to hear what it was. But instead of the expected, yes, my child, of course you can smoke, I have never seen him so angry or so adamant that I was asking for something that was never going to happen. And I never did smoke in front of him, even when I was in my twenties. <laughs> Incidentally, when my cousin saw the row I got, she chickened out and never did speak to her parents about smoking, so she got away with it scot-free. For some reason though, that memory came back to me as I was looking at the Gospel reading for this morning. James and John are about to ask Jesus for a favour. It was a major request. And I can imagine them working up to it in the same way that we had done, nudging one another and saying, go on, you ask him. No, you do it. Well, I'll wait and see what happens to you, and then I'll ask him. No, we will do it together. He will listen to us. Eventually, they get up the courage, and together James and John say, Jesus, there is something we want you to do for us. I don't think that for one minute, they expected Jesus to refuse them. Rather, I think they thought they were asking for nothing more than they were entitled to, as a reward for services rendered. Surely he would just say, fine, whatever you want you can have, before even hearing what the request might be. It was a good way, I think, for them to approach the subject. If Jesus agreed to give them whatever they wanted, then no matter what the object of the request was, he would be already committed to granting it, wouldn't he? It's a well-tested strategy for getting your own way. And we've all used it at some time or another. In fact, I confess that when I was here as locum and I wanted something, instead of asking straight out for it, I would often start by saying, I wonder if you would just do me a favour. Ring any bells? <laughs> and to your credit, the answer was always yes, of course, before you ever found out what it was I wanted. But then, of course, I never asked for the impossible, or for anything that was not in your power to provide. James and John, on the other hand, totally misjudged the outcome when they asked Jesus for their favour. Instead of saying yes immediately, before even hearing what he was being asked for, Jesus waits. He waits for them to come clean. He knew that they had been brooding about who was the greatest and how best to advance themselves above all the other disciples when it came to taking their place in the kingdom of heaven. The answer they came up with was to reserve the two best seats when the time came. Let us sit at your right and on your left when you take your place in glory, Jesus. They couldn't contain their ambition. They thought it would be all so simple to get what they wanted. Unfortunately for them, there was two things that stood in the way of James and John, ever receiving that kind of power and status. First of all, it wasn't in Jesus' power to grant such a request. And secondly, what they asked for went against every principle of what the Kingdom of Heaven is all about. It makes you wonder if James and John had ever listened to anything that Jesus had been teaching them in all their time as his disciples. He talked about the values of God's Kingdom being nothing like those of this world, and that to follow him meant giving up and not gaining power and prestige. So had James and John learned absolutely nothing from Jesus 
in all that time? Did they think he was talking about someone else when he said, I assure you that whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it? Were they asleep that time when the rich young man asked what it took to get eternal life? And Jesus said, the only way it could be done was if the young man let go of his need for power, wealth and position. And that's the operative word, his need for it. His attachment to his ambition. And only then, with none of these things to hold him back, could he be in the right frame of mind to become a follower of Jesus and gain the riches of heaven. The riches that Jesus was talking about were not the kind that the young man was used to. They couldn't be bought with silver or gold, nor could they be claimed by right of someone's position in life or social standing. But sadly it seems James and John didn't think that any of that and any of what Jesus had been teaching about these things applied to them. I know Christians like that, and so do you, who think they can use their worldly wealth and social standing to further their ambitions in the church. Like James and John, they tend to ignore everything that Jesus has said about the first being last and the last first, and that to follow him is to become the servant of all. They don't seem to grasp that in the Lord's kingdom, our earthly values are reversed. So that nothing we possess, no power or position in life can buy us a chosen place in heaven. Only God can guarantee our place there by his good grace and by Jesus dying for our sins on the cross. Through him, God does what we cannot do. We cannot save ourselves. Only Jesus can and has done that for us. And so a rich man or poor, king or those who walk the street, and every person in between, we are all given the same opportunity to come to Jesus in the faith and the belief that he alone can save and secure our place in the kingdom to come. The message is very clear. We are told that it is by grace that we are saved and not by works lest anyone should boast. James and John had heard it all before, as we have. But for some reason, they let it pass them by. They had simply chosen to ignore all the lessons that they had been given about the kind of person that Jesus was and the path he would take in order for God's salvation to be fulfilled in him. A path not covered in glory, but one that was subject to humility and suffering. At the time, none of that seemed to register with James and John, even though their own scriptures had spoken of what it would be like for Jesus when he came. He will be, said Isaiah, despised and rejected. He was treated harshly, but endured it humbly. He never said a word. Like a lamb about to be slaughtered, like a sheep about to be sheared, he never said a word. He was arrested and sentenced and led off to die, and no one cared about his fate. He was put to death for the sins of our people. But that, you see, was not the kind of example that James and John wanted to follow. They seemed to want some kind of power-driven Jesus who would advance their ambition. What was Jesus and his kingdom going to do for them to make them great? Was what they really wanted to know. Hence their request to have special privileges when they get to heaven. When the other disciples hear about it, they're furious. What gave James and John the right to want to have a better position than them? You know, I find the attitude of the other disciples a bit of a cheat. Considering it was only a few days beforehand that they had been arguing among themselves about the same thing. Who was the greatest? 
Like a good many of us, they seemed to suffer from short memories when it came to their own aspirations. And so Jesus did what he had done so many times in the past. He tried again to show them all the error of their ways. He tells them that the kingdom of heaven isn't about power and greatness, but servanthood and service. Those who would be leaders must first and foremost learn how to be servants. And be willing, if need be, to suffer for the sake of the kingdom. Can you do that? asked Jesus. Can you drink from the cup that I must drink from? Without even thinking about it, they say, yes, sure we can. Do you know I'm sure at the time the two disciples meant it? Because they still didn't have a clue about the extent of what lay ahead for Jesus by way of suffering and death on a cross. No doubt they thought, whatever it is, how bad can it get? We've already suffered before for Jesus. What about that time when the crowds turned against us? We did okay then. We can take whatever comes our way. But as you know, when it came to the end and the final events of Jesus' life began unfolding in front of them, the disciples discovered they couldn't take it after all. The cost was too great. And one by one, they deserted Jesus. And so did James and John. The two who were so sure that they would be there at the end to share whatever Jesus was going to face. It's a bit like those fair weather Christians that we all know of, who immediately, if the going gets tough, decide to opt out of the church. Mind you, sometimes, after a spell away, those who have left the church, for all sorts of strange reasons, come back again with a better understanding of what it's all about. And they come back the stronger for it. That's what it was like for the disciples. If you remember, all except Judas came back after the crucifixion to be followers of Jesus. And when they did, they were changed people, with a new and clearer understanding of what the kingdom of God was all about. Because of what Jesus their Lord had done for them, on that cross. They had seen with their own eyes the prophecy of Isaiah being played out in Jesus. James and John and all the others who wanted recognition and an easy life of it finally got the message and following the Lord they too accepted the way of the cross. They did exactly as Jesus said they would. Drink the cup he would drink and be baptised as he was baptised. Eleven of those twelve disciples did at the end die for the kingdom and for their role in preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Only John died a natural death of old age, but not after many near escapes. But as we know, death wasn't to be the end of the story for any of them. Not for Jesus and not for his disciples. There was the resurrection to follow and subsequent appearances of Jesus to his followers. Certainly it had taken James and John and no doubt the other disciples as well a while to get the message. But once they had, they never forgot the true meaning of greatness in the kingdom of heaven as it was defined by Jesus, excluding things like power, greed, ambition and status and being first in the queue, and instead including the virtues of love and humility and service, of kindness, meekness and mercy, compassion, putting others first and following the example of Jesus so that the first indeed become last and the last first. And any one of us who in faith tries to put those qualities into practice into our lives is considered great in God's kingdom. We have Jesus' word on that. Amen. We are going to sing and we're going to sing, it's 436 in the book,
Christ triumphant.
Let's pray. God, our Father, in glad thanksgiving and praise, we bring our offerings to you. Our money given in the plate and electronically as a token of our gratitude for all that you have given to us in Jesus our Saviour. And along with that, we bring our lives, that they may serve you, following Jesus' example who came to be servant of all. And we bring you our love, in response to the love that Jesus showed for us on the cross. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have promised to always do that for us, offering us your strength and our weakness, your peace to calm our often restless and anxious hearts. Help us to find our confidence in you when life seems uncertain and the way ahead seems rough. Make your presence known in the hearts of all who are hurting today, those who are ill in mind or body, the lonely and uncared for, and all your needy people, we pray. And grant to us all the peace of your spirit, the healing of your touch, the blessing of your companionship, the assurance of your constant love, and the promise of life everlasting. This we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose words we say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power and glory forever. Amen. We're going to sing our final hymn for this morning, hymn 465 in the books, Be Thou My Vision.
peace to love and serve the Lord together. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore.